This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 317 was recorded on March 31st, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Energy economist Phil Verlegger returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss what the transition to zero carbon will mean for the economy and financial markets. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Dakota Gold CEO Jonathan Aud will join us to discuss the performance of precious metals markets, private placement logistics, and much more. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric, let's jump into the S&P 500. Over two weeks since the FOMC, the S&P 500 is up 500 points. We was, rose over 4,600 for a brief period. The last couple of days, giving a little bit back. But what a run. What's your take on all of this? Hey, what's World War III to get in the way of a central bank's fueled uh, bull market, right? Oh, wait a minute. The central bank fueled part of this is kind of on hold, too. So that's the part that I don't really understand. The fact that the stock market is rallying through World War III doesn't surprise me because, as I've said many times on the show, wars are not generally bearish, the stock market, except in the very beginning. Uh, on the other hand, the, the Fed is real and the tapering cycle is real. Charlie McElligot told us not to expect a bottom until May. Uh, that still sounds about right to me. Now, clearly, the tape action says we're above all the moving averages. Looks like a full recovery is in play. I'm skeptical. All right, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index because uh, over the last couple of days, a little bit of uh, uh, a pause in the dollar advance. We were basically at a 52-week high. It looked like it was ready to go and, and gave some back. Uh, is the dollar uh, changed a major trend or is it still a, a pretty bullish chart to you? Well, I think the chart is still bullish, but we're coming up on 100 major round number resistance there. And I think this, this whole cycle is definitely a question mark in a lot of people's minds. There's lots and lots of reasons to seriously question whether or not the U.S. dollar's hegemony over the global financial system is going to be challenged. And I think it's very clear to the people paying attention that there's lots and lots of people around the world who are ready to ditch the dollar in favor of the alternative. The only problem is there is no alternative. I think there will be one eventually, and that will eventually, is, is that whatever the replacement is, I think a, a supranational digital reserve currency, but we'll see what happens. Whatever, uh, whatever happens, wherever this is headed, Patrick, those things are not affecting the dollar yet. What's affecting the dollar is the war cycle, and it's dollar bullish, and I think it'll probably stay dollar bullish. Eric, let's talk about crude oil and this intraday volatility we see, even though it hasn't really decisively broken into a big trend, just these three, four, five dollar whips higher and lower within hours is just uh, persistent. Uh, obviously, right now, it's all about this uh, release of the strategic reserves and all these other headlines. How do you put this all together here? Well, Patrick, as you say, at least the most recent uh, blip down in oil prices has been a result, as you said, of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve release announcement, supposedly a million barrels a day, although frankly, I'm not sure we even have the capacity to move a million barrels a day uh, out of uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve through the pipelines and into the rest of the system. But in any event, that's uh, what has the market all upset. The way I'm looking at this, okay, you've got kind of a perfect storm of bearish factors that could all hit the market kind of at the same time. That would be a Iran deal coming together, some kind of at least short-term Ukraine-Russia ceasefire, peace talk, some, some kind of agreement that's more than, than just we're working on it. And 
uh, you've also got SPR releases. The thing is, once all of those things have been priced in, and I think they now have been for the most part priced in, uh, there's really not a lot of other remedies to deal with a lot of very bullish price factors. So these things could all result in a further knockdown in prices by a few more dollars. But I think eventually we're headed higher. And I, despite the fact that I really, really, really hope that the... Uh, the geopolitical tension in Russia will de-escalate. Even if it does de-escalate, I don't think that $130 print was uh, going to be the, the, the cycle high. I think we'll eventually get higher than that before the summer is out. How did the inventories come in? Patrick, crude oil drawing down 3.4 million barrels nationally and 1 million barrels of that coming out of Cushing, Oklahoma. Now, it's important to keep in mind, this is spring, so that means it's inventory restocking season. We ought to be seeing builds on inventory, but we're still seeing drawdowns, so that's kind of concerning in terms of available supply. Gasoline building 785,000 barrels, distillates building 1.4 million barrels. So we do have some significant builds to offset those drawdowns in finished products. U.S. crude oil production ticking up 100,000 barrels to 11.7 million barrels. That is a cycle high. Now keep in mind, a lot of really smart analysts have said we'll never ever get back to 13.2 million or whatever the all-time all time high was set just a few years ago. Look, it's only a million and a half barrels away. I don't think it's completely out of the question. All right. Well, we got to talk some gold. Obviously, the first reaction at the start of the week was uh, a quick drop that temporarily even uh, looked like 1900 was going to give out. But really, uh, the buying just came right back in. We're back to about 1950. Not really above uh, last week's high yet, but uh, at least it's been working way uh, its way higher. Do you think uh, gold still has uh, some gas in the tank to uh, to punch back to its highs? Well, I really hope that it does, but if I look at the slow stochastics, it looks like they're kind of peaked and rolling over. Uh, we're, we're coming up against resistance at the short-term moving averages, and frankly, we're in the biggest geopolitical event since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the gold is acting like it's just no big deal. So I've been perplexed by this, Patrick. What I want to do is get an expert on in a special bonus interview in our postgame segment. We're going to get Jonathan Odd, CEO of uh, Dakota Gold, to join us and talk a little bit about what's going on and why the heck gold is not performing better in the face of what I think is an extremely bullish macro backdrop. All right, Eric, let's uh, wrap with the uh, 10-year Treasury yield because uh, the last two, three weeks, uh, we saw a rip from 170 basis points to over 250. Uh, just what a huge move. The last three days, it's a little bit of a pause. We're trading around uh, 232 at the time uh, of this recording. Uh, you think that was enough uh, or is there more risk to the bond market? I think there's more risk to the bond market, Patrick, and I do want to say that I have less conviction on fixed income than probably any of the other asset classes. It's not something that I trade actively, but as I look at this situation, Patrick, uh, if the move to 250 had been you know, the, the head fake before the big move in the other direction, we'd be moving bigger in the other direction by now. This looks to me like just a pause, and I wouldn't be surprised if we've got higher yields ahead. But I, I do want to qualify that, Patrick, to say it's just an interpretation of what I see in the chart. I don't really have a strong fundamental view in this market. Well, this week's feature interview guest is energy economist Dr. Philip Verlegger. Eric, why did we invite Dr. Verlegger back on the show this week? Well, Phil was very well reviewed on our first interview that we did with him, but particularly, I feel that we're in an incredibly, incredibly important moment in energy history. For more than 150 years, the entire economy has relied on petroleum as the primary source of energy for everything that we do in our lives. And it is a very good idea that we should phase out fossil fuels before the, the carbon kills us, but we're phasing it out before we phase in the replacement. It doesn't make sense. So to talk about this transition and what does it mean and what's it mean for the economy and what does it mean for capital markets, I really wanted to get Phil back on the show because he's one of the few people that really wants to talk about the big picture of the role that energy serves in the economy. Well, Eric's interview with Dr. Verlegger is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor.
Abex Technologies invites you to Smarter Markets' new podcast series, Demystifying Carbon Markets. Corporate climate pledges went mainstream in 2021. Moving into 2022, these companies are increasingly focused on developing and implementing plans to turn their climate pledges into climate action and understanding how carbon markets can help them turn their good intentions into meaningful change. For many, however, carbon markets remain unfamiliar, creating apprehension over potential risks. They have many questions. What are carbon markets? What types of projects help reduce carbon emissions? How do I judge the quality of these projects? Will the carbon markets be large enough to meet net zero goals? In this series, Smarter Markets teams up with Base Carbon Corporation to bring you the architects and practitioners of the carbon markets, seeking answers to all of these questions from people who know the markets best. Episodes are available weekly on Saturdays beginning February 5th. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is energy economist Phil Verlager, founder of PK Verlager LLC. Phil, it's great to get you back on the show. It's been way too long. Let's just start with the big picture of the energy market here. It seems to me like, uh, boy, we've got so many factors, a confluence of factors coming together that uh, really look like higher oil prices could be on the horizon. How do you see this? What's the big picture? What lays ahead? Well, it's complicated, like you say. Start with the macro economy. Inflation is running 7% in the United States. It's well above the 2% target for the European Central Bank. And so central bankers are going to tighten monetary policy. And they're, I think we're headed probably for a recession. It's not clear how severe, but they want to bring inflation down. Oil's contributing to this. Metals are contributing to this. Food prices are contributing to this, particularly with the war in Ukraine. So what I see is a uh, probably a drop in oil consumption, and uh, that may help bring the market back into balance. We're short right now some crude oil, although oil exporting countries could boost production. We're also, more importantly, we're short diesel fuel. Diesel is a big problem. Now, we were talking about diesel three years ago in the run-up to the IMO standards to take sulfur out of marine diesel. At that time, I was warning of $200 oil, and most people didn't agree with me. I was warning because we have a problem making low sulfur fuel. Low sulfur crude is great to make it. High sulfur crude works only if you have the proper refining capacity, and that's right now is being used to, to the maximum extent possible. So, what this means is diesel prices are up. The margins uh, are, I just saw someplace that there's something like $60 a barrel. And truck drivers are paying higher and higher prices. That's going to pull up crude prices. That's going to add to inflation. That's going to make it harder for central banks to ease off. So that you know, to bring the, mar bring the diesel market back into balance, you, you may take a more severe recession. Problem could get solved if... Uh, the government, U.S. government and the other governments decided to release uh, the light, sweet crude oil from strategic reserves. Light, sweet crude oil produces a lot of diesel and it can produce it at almost any refinery. But government officials seem to be really stubborn about using it. We've used 5% of the strategic stocks in this episode, and I guess they're not going to do much. And, you know, it's it's idiotic, but that's where we are. So we're probably going to see higher oil prices, a significant recession. And uh, although this, and central bankers generally don't know the names of oil ministers, the oil ministers are going to discover, uh, in exporting countries are going to discover in two or three years that, oh, demand is way down because of the recession, and it may be down permanently. Now, I'm seeing a lot of analysts make an assumption, which is they say, look, there's a lot of signs that there's a recession coming. Surely that has to mean lower energy prices. So let's kind of prepare for that. It seems to me like there's a scenario they're maybe not considering, which is the one where the cause of the recession is high energy prices. That's happened before. I, I think you could make an argument in 2008 that high energy prices may have been a contributor to the whole credit crisis. Now, 
does it make sense to think that there is a scenario where we have a full on recession where energy prices stay high the whole time? Or does it kind of work the other way where once the recession's on, it's got to bring prices down? Because it seems to me like there's really not a whole lot of spare capacity. And I, I wonder if we're nearing a point where recession or no recession, we just get into a grind higher in price. Well, we, we could get into a grind higher in prices. I'm not quite as convinced as other people are because we're seeing some significant drops in consumption uh, like California. But let me go back to that, to your, uh, the, your presumption on 2008. The good economic research on this, Brookings published a couple of papers on this, suggests that the recession in 2008 kind of started with oil prices, uh, consumers backing away from SUVs. But Alan Blinder, who was the vice chairman of the Fed and teaches at Princeton, and others have concluded that energy really was not a big deal in 2008. 2008 was due to uh, subprime lending and the collapse of subprime lending. Uh, and if you go back, uh, uh, Ben Bernanke wrote a great paper, oh, in the late 90s, or eight, yeah, I think the late 90s, looking at uh, at the first energy crisis. And I was a young economist then. And basically you came back it was monetary policy energy you know energy is important to the economy but not that important and almost all the good macroeconomic research now says that you know energy doesn't by itself bring on a recession this time uh, it's not going to be different from energy point of view this time will be different because there's a huge problem with wheat from ukraine and russia so we may have very high food stuff prices. The oil prices are high, so we're going to have higher interest rates. The higher interest rates are going to make it extremely difficult for emerging market economies, those who've invested in emerging market economies. And we're going to, we could easily see some big debt problems. But having followed energy for 50 years and been an energy economist most of that time, uh, yeah, I, I've kind of learned to... Uh, respect the the views of the uh, macroeconomists and the uh, particularly the monetary economists that, that energy is while is i guess i would say interesting to to the monetary people it's not that important let's talk about the transition which is beginning now it seems to me we're at a really pivotal moment in history here for the last 150 years the entire world's energy source has primarily been rock oil and that's just the way the world works. And we've pretty much committed, seems like the government commitment is there, that we're going to get off of fuels and electrify the economy. And I'm all for it, except for one thing. Feels to me like the ESG movement is really pushing to phase out a lot of new investment in energy exploration and production before we phase in the replacement. A am I right to be concerned that Perhaps policymakers are not completely in touch with what this transition is going to take. And particularly, what are the opportunities for investors to maybe notice where markets are mispricing things because people are not completely in touch with what it's going to take? That's a, uh, it's a very good and a very complicated question. Uh, and there's several parts to it. First, it is clear that the environmentalists are limiting access in some countries, to oil and gas resources. The uh, Biden budget, which was released yesterday, shows uh, they don't expect to offer any offshore properties for lease. Now, the courts have ruled that they have to, and, and, but then other courts have ruled that they, ha uh, that, uh, they can't do a, a global, can't consider global warming and and there's a conflict, and it's going to have, probably have to go to the Supreme Court to set some rules clearly. And, you know, it could be that we uh, we don't have any le leases of offshore property uh, until uh, 2024, maybe 2025. So that that's one part of the thing. But the uh, the other part of the thing is the you, you keep hearing these statements. You heard it at CIRA. You hear, heard it at the World Oil Conference, uh, World Oil Conference in, in, in Houston in December, the people from the oil industry say, look, we need more investment uh, from the financial community. The big thing is that the investors don't seem to want to invest in oil. You know, this is a, a question not of government policy. This is a question of where people with money see the future returns. 
and investors seem to have concluded that fossil fuels don't offer them much or don't offer them the same prospects, say, that Tesla does, that uh, Amazon and, and other uh, industries, or maybe even uh, these uh, smaller modular nuclear power plants. There's plenty of money out there that's available for investment. The investors are, are turning their back on the on the fossil fuel industry. Uh, why? Well, uh, maybe you know they just don't see the future returns there. It, maybe the industry just hasn't offered them the future returns uh, the returns in the past. One of the things that is, is pretty clear to me is that you know that, that investors uh, aren't really hot on oil, hot on gas, or hot on coal, and and so. You know, it, it, there is an opportunity for for, uh, for the for investors listening to this podcast, because that means that probably there's going to be a limited supply of fossil fuels, and that fossil fuel prices will probably stay high for a while uh, until the um, either the economy slows or the, and, and or the transition gets going. But you know, it's a question of where people who have control of their own money want to put it. Phil, let's talk more about how we get through this transition and what the uh, the challenges are going to be. I hear critics and skeptics talking about things like, look, there's not enough electrical grid delivery capacity to charge a whole nation full of electric vehicles. No country in the world has that. So there's an assumption when you're going to roll out electric vehicles that everybody's going to buy one and just charge it up at home, when in reality, that entire country's electric grid has to be re-engineered in order for everybody to be able to do that. Then I hear other people tell me, who claim to be expert at this, tell me, no, no, that's all just nonsense. It's a bunch of rhetoric. It's not true. Well, okay, who's got the hard data? What's the real story here? Do we have a problem that we can't really electrify the economy because the grid is not up to it? Or is that exaggerated? Uh, the answer, again, it's a, an extremely complicated question, and you're asking the right question. I think, now I'm certainly not an expert on the, on the electricity grid, but it's absolutely clear that you couldn't electrify the entire economy right now with the grid we have. That just can't happen. And if you are thinking about electrifying the economy with central station power stations, as we have in the past, it's going to take a lot of work to, uh, to uh, build a larger grid. The question becomes one of, is that the way we're going to go? I mean, uh, I remember 30 years ago or so talking to World Bank economists about the potential shortage of copper because it was going to take just a huge mu amount of copper to wire up all uh, uh, telephones to everybody in Africa. And, uh, you know, it was, you're going to have to string the wires, the poles and everything else. Well, that didn't happen. And they, they all have phones now and it's called cellular phones. So the question is, do we do what Amory Lovin says, which is really move to a much more diversified uh, and localized generating system with a lot of local solar on your house, on buildings and so on, uh, batteries and and, uh, and other facilities, and this is a technical technological issue, and, and it comes back. You know, it's uh, Vaclav Smil has written the um, a number of books about uh, transitions and saying, well, once you build the capital of goods, you use it until they expire. Uh, that and his books are very good, but that's not true. I mean, you sit. Uh, France laid the keel for the uh, SS France about the time the first 707 started taking passengers from New York to London. Uh, that SS France was a failure as a trans, uh, as a transatlantic passenger ship because people didn't use the ships the ships anymore. So it became the Normandy and cruised the Caribbean for a while and was scrapped well before its life was over. And so I don't, you know, I think I understand and I think everybody's right. We can't electrify the economy with the current grid, but we can electrify the economy if things change and we move, say, to using cellular, the, the equivalent of cellular phones and, and local generation. Cellular phones? Uh, well, it, it's, it, you know, if you sit back and think about it and, and extend the cellular phone concept, most people don't have landlines anymore. More and more of my friends are saying, we're not, we've abandoned our landlines. It has happened in my house. We have a landline. We have an elevator in the house, and the city requires us to have a, a landline in case the, the elevator fails. And so, but you look at the drop in landline connections uh, that, that get put out, the data get put out. Uh, you know they've gone away. So 
if enough people go to uh, to using solar and, and the cost of solar generation keeps coming down and, and if the regul- electricity regulators let that happen, uh, maybe I think we probably do it, but we just do it with a very different kind of electricity generating system. What are the other major challenges that you see ahead as we go through this energy transition? And particularly, what are people in the industry perhaps missing or not seeing on the horizon? Wow. <laughs> uh, let's go back to this the, to the question on diesel fuel. Uh, in 2008, the Europe pushed ahead with low sulfur diesel when the world's, world's refiners weren't ready to produce enough of it. And so the price of uh, diesel fuel went way up relative to crude uh, refining margins. And and that led to the $130 crude. Same thing is happening now. It's happening in part because the shipping industry reduced the the sulfur content required for uh, for fuel back in 2019. And, uh, And as I said earlier on the show, in 2019, I was saying, you know, this could create a problem. It's creating a problem today. So there's a shortage of low sulfur products. Uh, the first, you know, the biggest problem really is is and has been for a long time, the failure of environmental regulators pushing things like low sulfur fuel for ships and the oil industry and everybody else to talk in a, uh, in a civilized way and, and plan ahead. They didn't plan in 2008. They didn't plan with the IMO. And we're seeing the problem right now with a, uh, with a shortage of diesel fuel and a shortage of low sulfur uh, shipping fuel. So, you know, the big issues are really kind of are, are this ability to talk. We have a significant problem with helping uh, emerging market economies move off of fossil fuels. Uh, and so you hear read statements came out of this Atlantic Council in, in Dubai that, you know, the, the, poor, the poorer countries need fossil fuel energy for a long time. And the, the major uh, developed countries need to give them the money to do this. Uh, I don't think the major developing countries are going to give them the money to do this. I think that the Europeans are going to impose uh, rules which essentially penalize financially countries that haven't adjusted quickly and gotten off of fossil fuels. And so you know, we could be le- uh, heading towards a seri- uh, serious issue where there's a lot of starvation and, and uh, a lot of harm going on particularly outside the developed nations. And if that happens, then you're going to get a lot of people from Africa trying to go to Europe, from South America trying to come into the United States. And, and migration is going to be a much, much bigger issue. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, macro. And I, I mean, you talk, you've t- the title of your program is Macro Voices, and it's a serious macro issue of how to coordinate this. And it's not just within the energy sector. It's between the energy sector and policy planners, and uh, and really development officials around the world. Phil, how able is the energy industry to really do what you just described in this current environment where nobody's really sure whether Russia is friend or foe as far as, you know, they're still selling us energy? Are they allowed to sell us energy? You know, it kind of changes day to day. What are the consequences of the present geopolitical challenge event to this transition and the ability of planners to to anticipate? Because it seems to me how things go with Ukraine could play a pretty darn big role in what the price of oil looks like in the next six months. Oh, how things go in Ukraine is going to play a big role in what the price of oil is for the next five years. Uh, I guess, you know, as you're asking the question, the thing that flashed across my mind was oil is the new tobacco industry. In, in the sense that it's going to be targeted as, you know, they're the bad guys, we need to shut them down, or in some other way? No, but no, not quite in that sense. In the, in the sense that nobody's listening to them. You know, it's, it's, I, I sent an email to, I, I write for a number of organizations, I write for EIG, and I sent a note to my editor there, you know, right now, I think I'm living on Venus and the oil industry is on Mars. You know, and they talk about the oil producing countries say, we know how to manage the oil market. And and they're younger guys. They've never heard of Paul Volcker. And as I said, the central bankers never really have paid much attention to the oil people. There needs to be a much more constructive dialogue between oil producing countries, the oil sector, economic planners, and uh, the central bankers around the world. I, you know, let me give you one example. Uh, for the last month or so, uh, commodity 
companies such as VTOL and so on have been talking about the credit squeeze they face because of the high prices. You, you know, the price of natural gas went up and the margins uh, that they're required to put up are so high that, you know, even a firm like Traffic Era, uh, where people take home multi million dollar salaries, uh, is looking at bankruptcy. Or, or to, to continue operating the way they want uh, they want to operate, they need an in, injection of uh, a small sum of $3 billion, a little money. Uh, there is just right now no communication. The oil industry doesn't make it things any easier by saying, look, you're going to be paying $150 or $200 a, a barrel. And central bankers say, well, we're going to keep inflation to 2%, which means uh, I guess growth is going to be slower and we, we're not going to need the oil. Somehow, a dialogue has to be struck, and you know, the oil industry, the people in the fossil fuel industry have been systematically bad at reaching out. Rather, you know, because rather than saying, "Well, price is going to go way up," uh, they need to say, "Look, we need to find a way to keep prices at a level where we can keep fl- inflation under control." That isn't happening. It's not happening out of the Middle East. It's not ha- happening out of uh, most private companies. The uh, uh, U.S. companies like Pioneer and so on said, well, we're not going to expand production because we don't want to offend OPEC. Well, what the firms like Scott Sheffield, who's CEO of uh, Pioneer, have done is offended central bankers indirectly. And, you know, central bankers are not going to uh, be very flexible in terms of letting inflation go up a little because inflation is far more important to them. They don't want to get it embedded in the economic thinking. Than a, than a uh, a recession, which perhaps pushes oil back down to forty dollars a barrel. Now there are a lot of people that are beginning to talk about price controls. I personally have a, a pretty strong bias that that's never the right way to solve a problem, but a lot of people think it is. Uh, are price controls potentially a a good idea? And regardless of whether they're a good idea, are they likely coming or not? Uh, oh God! <laughs> oh God! Uh, so when I had color in my hair, and it's very gray now, uh, I went to work in the Ford administration at the Council of Economic Advisors. And the focus, uh, the reason I went there was to get us out of price controls. I stayed at the U.S. Treasury in the Carter administration because I got asked by the Secretary of Treasury to help get rid of crude oil price controls. And I managed to help lead the effort to get us out of price controls. De- the energy departments didn't. They, uh, and as for my uh, for for getting us out of it, I, I was rewarded by being asked to draft a thing called the windfall profit tax. Uh, these are not good ideas. Matter of fact, they're terribly bad ideas. Uh, the distortions they caused. If you go back and look at the World War II experience, and and I got into this business because my grandfather's good friend had been a senior official of uh, of the. Uh, in the Roosevelt administration, had in fact run the price control programs for a while, and then been ahead of the St. St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, and he, he, you know, told me all when I was in high school all the problems with price controls. I cannot, I, I can't scream, but I don't, you know, you don't want them. Now, so that is a terrible idea. Uh, there are some controls that might help. Uh, one of the things, uh, and there's the report I sent you that, that, I, that I sent out for notes on the margin, I've been following very closely how hedging of call options on crude and uh, on crude oil has exacerbate, exacerbated the volatility of oil prices. Uh, one of the steps that one could take is to require people who write calls on these, uh, say, $300 call on oil uh, be fully covered. That is, if you write, if a, pers- a firm writes uh, a calls on a hundred contracts, it must be long a hundred contracts. Uh, under all our modern derivatives models, if I write a call today on uh, three hundred dollar oil for a hundred contracts, I only have to have about a third of a contract, one third of a contract. That is, I need to to cover that to hedge it. Uh, and if price goes up, I have to buy more. So. And Javier Blas wrote a great piece for Bloomberg in in January 18th saying Wall Street was about to take the oil market on a wild ride. And it has, because as as I do the numbers, the number of calls out there are so large that every time uh, somebody says, well, oil prices might maybe should go up about 50 cents or something like that, it gets magnified to $5. So you don't want price controls. There are some 
the financial markets are out of control. And as Blas said, people are buying lottery tickets on oil. It's, you know, it's the odds are better buying call options on oil right now or call options on natural gas in Europe than they are on betting on a, on a sporting, a sporting event. The, uh, you know, you just look at the handle in the sporting events uh, and how much it goes back to the, the better versus what oil is and oil's earning much better returns. That needs to change. That could change, but you don't want to tax and you don't, you don't want just sudden taxes on oil and you don't want uh, price controls. I couldn't possibly agree more, Phil, that we don't want price controls. But the very fact that it's such a bad idea almost uh, tells my cynical mind that it's more likely to happen if government's in charge. You've been through this once before in the 1970s uh, event. For, For some of us that are a little bit younger than you are, tell us a little bit more about maybe what people have forgotten about price controls, how that went, and why it's such a bad idea. But also... For, for fatalists like me who think it's probably coming even though it's a bad idea, what do we need to be thinking about as investors in terms of getting ready for it? We agree 100%. You know, it's an economic policy. If there's a really great idea, it's almost impossible to get it through. And if it's a bad idea, it almost always happens. Uh, that seems to be Murphy's law or, or Murphy's corollary. Uh, the problem with with price controls essentially is that, let me rephrase that, the problem with price controls are, because it's plural, the myriad of details that you have to get into to make them work. When we went into this in 1971, uh, 50 years ago, 50 years ago plus six months, uh, they froze them for 90 days. For 90 days, okay, you can just freeze prices and most things will be fine. But if you go much further, then you start to say, well, we have a problem here. We've lost some capacity here or or something else. And we start having to make adjustments. And it means you have to start building a bureaucracy. And we built a bureaucracy uh, called the Cost of Living Council in the uh, 70s. And they were looking into everything and everybody had to file all this information. And then you had to, you know, if you had a problem, then you could apply for, to get a special exemption. We had special courts, temporary court, emergency court of appeals, uh, which lasted a lot, was, was not very temporary. You know, it's a rabbit hole. Once you go down it, it, it it's just, there's so many details that you have to start looking at. That's a problem. So, you know, and you know, if you want to see what it happens, how it's, uh, it is, just look at what happened to uh, trade when uh, the previous president started impo- imposing uh, trade sanctions on China, and and you know people then steel companies had a problem because they imposed them on one kind of steel. So a lot of U.S. manufacturers who bought the steel and then fabricated and so on were faced with going out of business. I, it, it is the world economy is far too complex. To, to allow something like this to go. The details are just awful. So it's terrible. Now, for an investor, you know, there were a lot of people who made a huge, huge sums of money out of this because there are always little niches where, where somebody who, who's bringing his costs down can, can suddenly start making huge sums of money because other competitors are, are facing constraints. And what, what one has to do is start looking for where are the big productivity gains, what are the big businesses, and, and go there. Uh, my guess is, the, you know, so it's the technologically advanced businesses that will move ahead and be very successful. It may well be uh, that uh, with uh, uh, that electric vehicle manufacturers wind up doing really well with something like this. Because uh, if their if their costs come down, as I think they probably will, uh, but you really have to start nosing around because nobody tells you. You know, they're uh, you know, the analysts don't pick rarely pick this up because nobody really talks about their big uh, big advantages. You talked earlier about how energy affects the economy, but it's not as big of an effect as central bank policy. And I I agree very strongly. But at the same time, it seems to me that the macroeconomic phenomenon of inflation is very definitely a 
major, major factor in the economy. And there's at least some people who hold the opinion that the cost of energy is the primary driver or one of the primary drivers of inflation. So just to clarify what you said before, uh, to what extent do you think that the price of energy is the actual cause of the inflation that we're seeing? And to the extent that that is involved, doesn't that really give oil a bigger role in the economy than, than we d- discussed earlier? Uh, well, okay. So first, if you go back to what central bankers think, and there, uh, there's a woman, uh, Schnabel, who's German, who's the member, German member of the EC, European Central Bank, voting member, who, who spoke at the American Finance uh, Conference in uh, January. And her point, and she was talking, and she's uh, an inflation hawk, and she was saying, look, uh, we don't need to worry about rising energy prices if they don't get embedded in inflation expectations. What central bankers look at today, and they did not look at in 73, is inflation expectations. If If consumers don't expect the inflation to last, central bankers will be much more relaxed than if it starts getting embedded. Now, now the question is, is energy really important to consumers? Well, consumers talk, the price of gasoline gets everybody's attention. But in fact, the share of the amount, amount consumers have been spending on gasoline has been declining dramatically over the last 50 years. So that right now, it's not a huge number. It's 2% or so. So increases in the price of gasoline costs some are a burden on some consumers, but not an aggregate. And so that is not such a huge deal here. Uh, and it, you know, the price of natural gas has gone up here, but not by the amounts that has gone up in Europe. So the, so the answer basic you know, the answer is it doesn't look right now like oil and gasoline prices are really affecting consumer expectations on inflation. What is infecting, affecting consumer expectation on inflation? Cost of clothes, cost of shoes. Well, the, there it's the cost of uh, uh, what's going on on the logistical issues, the fact that we're just not getting the stuff from China quickly enough. Uh, the cost of food. Now, to, to a certain extent, food works into the, uh, fuel works into the cost of food, but the price of food is also uh, determined by uh, the size of harvests and so on. You work it back, and you know, I, I'm guilty of this because I used I used to say, well, energy was really important uh, to the economy, and the fact is, there are a whole lot of factors, and uh, if I were a central banker, you know, I would not be paying much attention to energy. I'd be paying attention to wages, to uh, and and you know the fact that two or three million people haven't come back into the wa- labor force, and so labor wages are going up. And, you know, the biggest issue uh, for central bankers really is prolonged increase in wages, wage increases that are not matched by productivity increases are really detrimental to the economy, uh, far more detrimental than energy. So that's really why central bankers have been so relaxed about the rise in oil prices. Now, there's another theory that I've had that concerns me anyway, which is it seems to me like nobody really knows what OPEC plus spare capacity is. Of course, they tell us numbers, but I'm skeptical of their accuracy. And it seems to me like basically everything is fine until OPEC runs out of spare capacity. And at that point, we don't have a backup plan. And I can't tell how close the clock is to midnight, so to speak because I don't know how much spare capacity OPEC Plus really has, and I'm convinced that the individual countries in OPEC Plus probably are playing poker with each other, so most of them don't know how much the other guys have. So I'm not sure there's anybody who really knows the total spare capacity of OPEC Plus. Uh, am I right to be s- concerned about these things, or am I barking up the wrong tree? It's an, it's an important issue. I, I think that the UAE and Saudi Arabia have between them probably 3 million, 3.5 million barrels a day of surplus capacity. That's about where it is. And there may be uh, a little more in Kuwait. Now, I I don't lose any sleep over this because uh, I think that, you know, probably more capacity will come on from these countries, but it's, you know, the they're not going to use it. There's the stubbornness there. You know, I, I actually, uh, when I read these statements from the oil exporting countries saying, you know, we're in charge of the oil markets. We understand it. Well, they don't. 
Uh, and then they say, but you really have to provide us protection against uh, these uh, missiles that are being sent at us from Yemen. Well, you know, it's quite frankly, I, I think we ought to pull all the U.S. people out of Saudi Arabia and just let the Saudis defend themselves uh, if they're not going to be a little more cooperative on oil. Uh, and, and the same thing for the UAE. So I, it's but. Coming back, you know, I've seen these studies for a long time relating between oil prices and capacity, and uh, I quite frankly don't believe them. I just, I figure that there's more capacity there if the countries wanted to do, use it. They don't. They have a, they have market power right now, and they're they're uh, choosing to to squeeze, try to squeeze us. Now, another thing that's gotten a lot of people's attention, and I know that you wrote about it recently in the latest Notes on the Margin, which is your fantastic uh, report that you publish, that is the question of prompt time spreads on both Brent and WTI. Uh, obviously, the tension in Russia is part of this, but you know, the, really the amount, uh, the premium that's being put on the prompt month, uh, prompt delivery month, Anybody who's got spare oil could be delivering into the market. And although on the day that we're speaking, we're down a bit on some some peace talk news, we were north of $3 a month on roll premiums. So anybody who had any oil could sell it into the market and buy it back a month later for a guaranteed $3 return. And they're not doing it. So it just really says there's no oil in the market. I get that there's big risk in Russia, but why are these spreads so wide? There's one word that describes it, hoarding. And we've seen it many times. Uh, we've just seen it with COVID, toilet paper, paper towels. People rush out to buy because they're worried about supplies. I, it's, uh, you know, I you go back to uh, December 1973, Johnny Carson, who had a late night, well, the, the best late night television show at the time and well known came out one night and said, well, there, this is when people were lining up for gasoline. He said, there's another shortage coming and it's for toilet paper. And there wasn't, there's plenty of toilet paper around, but the next day the shelves were cleaned uh, and there was a toilet paper shortage. Uh, this is an issue that it goes back to the beginning of time. When people start worrying about future supplies, they become less willing to sell them whereas buyers become more aggressive at trying to buy them. And so you, you build up a hoarding premium. And I think the hoarding premium as of last Friday was something on the order of $16 a barrel for Brent crude, maybe $18. The hoarding premium for heating oil, for diesel fuels, uh, about $40 a barrel, a dollar a gallon. Uh, this is natural. You've, we see it in every commodity as everything. And, and, uh, it just has to do with the uncertainty on supplies. If inventories were higher, it would be lower. But I mean, we saw the same thing in, in uh, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. On August 1st, uh, 1990, there's no problem. And then on August 2nd, the invasion it came and, and the prompt premium went way up. The spreads went way up. And all the oil experts and people in the government said, we don't understand. There's plenty of oil around. There's no reason to use strategic reserves. And we're seeing this, hearing the same thing today. And it, it's, you know, it's my real frustration is that the energy policy people are so dumb when it comes to economics. This is, has been here. We've observed it. Uh, and uh, we're sitting on 1.6 billion barrels of strategic stocks or 1.5 billion around the world. And all they've used is 5%. I mean, it's, I don't know what they're holding it for. I mean, this is the big, the real big shock. Were, were there to be a huge release? Prices would be down. The price of gasoline would be down 50, 75 cents a gallon. I mean, it's psychological, and it's been here forever. Phil, as we close, we've already talked about some of the problems. Let's talk about what the world should be doing and could be doing. What should we be doing in order to mitigate or deal with these energy price challenges that the world faces right now? Well, we should step forward and embrace what the United States and Europe did last weekend, where the United States is pushing to supply more natural gas to Europe to help fill a real gap that they have in other areas. It is, today is a time for humility on the part of oil producers, consumers, 
across the globe, natural gas producers and consumers. We really need an understanding on the part of oil producers in the Middle East that this is an economic crisis and that more production is needed to kind of soften the blow on, on price levels. We need humility on the part of oil consumers that they're going to have to pay higher prices. Governments across the globe where the consumers are affected by higher prices uh, should not be cutting prices, cutting taxes on consumers because uh, that does sends the wrong signal. We have to reduce demand. On the other hand, governments should take steps to make consumers whole. This means giving them checks. One of the best ideas I've seen, and it's been criticized, is in California, where the the state's going to provide uh, credit cards for $400 to everybody who owns a vehicle. Well, they should provide it to everybody. Give them money. Don't cut the price. Give them money so that they uh, so that the impact of the higher prices on the consumer budgets are mitigated, and the consumer has a choice to spend the money someplace else. That keeps the economic activity going. That tends to move the co- the economy off energy and adjust to the higher prices. What we need is policies that somehow stabilize growth while cutting the use of oil, cutting the use of natural gas in these terribly difficult circumstances. Phil, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about Notes on the Margin. That is the report. And I'm not going to call it a newsletter because newsletters don't have uh, (laughs) the amount of footnotes that you have in this excellent report. For people who are not familiar with it, we do have a sample copy. The March 28th issue is linked in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says looking for the downloads. Phil, tell them what they can expect to find both in that issue and in future issues of Notes at the Margin. Well, what Notes at the Margin is, and there's a companion publication occasionally, I just essentially what I call hard-ass economics. I I look at the oil markets. I've been looking at them for 35 years, basically as commodity markets, and, you know, trying to find the important economic issues of the time. You know, in in this recent issue, one of the things I looked at was the decline in gasoline use in California, where there's been a massive penetration of electric vehicles as compared to Texas, where there isn't. And what you find is that California consumption is down 18%. It's it's really an economic exercise. I'm work, trying to work on a book that looks at the difference between 1973 and what's going to happen going forward based on all the, all the changes that have happened in the economy. And it's an economic report. It is not an, an analysis of companies, and it's not really an effort to project forward, although I, I do project forward based on some f- financial indicators once in a while. But it, it, it's, uh, it's it's an economic exercise. It's, as somebody said, it's almost a hobby at this point. But it's, you know, it, it's trying to bring some economic understanding to a, an area where there is uh, precious little economic analysis written. And I'm happy to, you know, I'm always happy to talk to people about it. And again, listeners, you'll find a sample issue linked in your Research Roundup email, and there's contact information in there if you're interested in a subscription. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. I've talked with several guests about topics like inflation and fears of a market correction, and those are real concerns for many investors. I'm sure many of you are wondering where to put your money. Many investors are turning to alternative assets for protection. You could look into traditional assets like gold, real estate, and bonds, but there's one unexpected asset everyone's talking about lately, blue chip art. Its growth has outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 through 2020, and it has almost no correlation to other asset classes. In other words, its value doesn't drop as much as other investments when markets crash. Most people don't realize you can now invest in million-dollar art by Banksy, Monet, and even Picasso. To discover how to access this asset class, visit masterworks.art slash macrovoices. That's masterworks.art slash macrovoices. See important disclosures at macrovoices.io slash disclaimer. Now, back to your hosts. 
Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, great interview with uh, Phil Verlegger. Now we have Jonathan Odd, CEO of Dakota Gold, joining us for a bonus post-game interview. Now, Eric, before we bring Jonathan on uh, the line, please tell our listeners why we invited him for a special bonus interview this week. Well, as our regular listeners know, I've been quite frustrated with the gold market. I really feel like the gold bugs' uh, big predictions have all come true. They really are debasing the currency hand over fist. We've got a huge geopolitical risk event, and gold can't even make a new all-time high on that. So I've wanted to get an update from that. And Jonathan Odd is a particularly interesting guy. Now, the way that I learned about Jonathan, there was a a panel that Rick Rule ran a few years ago. It was called Living Legends of Mining. And they got all of the most famous guys in mining, which was, you know, people like Robert Friedland and Bob Quartermain and, and those kind of guys, and basically said a bunch of questions about the industry. And the last question was, Who's the up and comer? Who's who's going to be the next living legend of mining? And Bob Quartermain's answer was a resounding Jonathan Odd, and I'd never heard of the guy before. So it was actually uh, Marion Katusa who uh, who introduced me to this story, and it turns out that Jonathan actually seems to have pulled Bob Quartermain out of retirement somehow. I'm not sure whose idea it was if uh, if Jonathan talked him into it or it was the other way around, but they're actually launching a major gold producing company together. So I wanted to uh, kind of find out from the expert what the heck is going on with the market and why gold's not doing what we expected it to. All right, let's bring Jonathan on. Jonathan, great to have you on as a first-time guest. Now, let's start with the big picture for precious metals. Now, personally, I've been excited about the rally we've seen in gold, but Eric has been uh, coming on week after week to it, telling our listeners that he's disappointed uh, in gold's performance, uh, considering we've had this major geopolitical risk event and potentially the start of a new world war. What's your take? Is gold uh, still a good hedge for both inflation and geopolitical risk? And why hasn't gold and gold mining shares performed better in this environment. Listen, first of all, thanks very much for, for having me on the show. And and uh, I do share some of your your frustrations that the gold price is not significantly higher than than where it is today. You know, I think historically speaking, most geopolitical rallies usually get faded. However, I think there's something much bigger going on here. And one of the reasons why uh, I and we are so excited about, about where the price of gold uh, could go you know, I think with with what Russia has done in invading Ukraine, it's really uh, redefining uh, and, and and drawing a line with 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 uh, some key international relationships. And I don't want to say that it's the end of globalization, but I think there's these strategic alliances that are being formed. And uh, I, you know, again, I think the backdrop for these gold prices and significantly higher with with what the Fed is trying to do and has been put in a quarter to do. I think I think will bode well for the price of gold. And lastly, typically, the first rate hike in a rising cycle typically starts the new move in a in a, in a broader gold price increase. And then, just lastly, I think you've what's really interesting is you've got the two largest economies in the world doing opposite things with interest rates. And I think at some point there's going to be a you know a, a collision course. So uh, very exciting times. Jonathan, let's talk about gold mining shares specifically, because something, frankly, as you said, is a lot of geopolitical rallies get faded in time. And if you look at what was going on before this geopolitical risk event, we had gold kind of trying to rally, but mining shares really, really performing awfully, awfully, awfully badly. Some people think that mining shares are a good leading indicator for where the price of gold is headed, and that would have suggested gold was headed lower. Should we be concerned about that, or is there something else that was causing the mining shares to be seemingly so cheap compared to the price of gold? Well, I think sometimes you know you saw the price of gold move, and then you saw you know physical buying, you saw money flowing into the ETF. So there's passive fund buying, and then that trickles down into the larger names. And typically there's, there's a few names that, 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 you know, where that money first goes, the Franco Nevadas, the Newmonts, the Barracks, the Agnicos, and then it starts to trickle down into, into some of the smaller names. But I think there's still a general reluctance for the generalists to, to come in. You know, it, the gold sector is, is just over 1% of global assets. So it's still a very small asset class. And a lot of generalists are, 
you know, still trying to figure out, okay, have the gold companies learn their lessons from past discretions of being uh, not exactly very disciplined and being terrible allocators of capital. So I, I, I think the gold industry as a whole has done a really good job of being disciplined, of returning uh, capital back to shareholders in the form of buybacks or dividends. So I, I, I do like the health of the industry right now going into this next phase of, the, of this market. For the benefit of our listeners who are accredited investors, I want to talk a bit about this capital formation process. Now, folks, the, the way that this works in the big picture is the first money for these new companies is raised from accredited investors in private placement financings. And you know, I was involved in a, a financing for a technology company, Abex Technologies, and fantastic company. I am still very excited about the company's prospects. But what sometimes happens is you get people into these financings, and when somebody decides they're going to take their profits and run, and they start selling aggressively into an illiquid market with these very small, undercapitalized companies, they can crash the price of the stock, even though there's been no material change in fundamentals. And it's just so frustrating to me when I get involved in one of these private placements and I see other investors screwing up the deal for everybody by being foolish about how aggressively they sell their shares. Now, you did something in the JR Resources, which was the predecessor company that led to Dakota Gold, that was I had never seen before. Please describe what you did differently in terms of how you structured that private placement and why that was of benefit to investors like me. In the interest of full disclosure, by the way, I should mention that I am an investor in uh, Jonathan's company uh, in substantial size. Jonathan, please tell our listeners what you did for the benefit of myself and other JR Resources investors as you made the transition to Dakota Gold. Sure. So thanks, Eric. And so the JR Resources stands for Jonathan and Robert. So we weren't very original in the naming of our private company, but so we're principals. So Bob Quartermain and myself were the two largest shareholders in JR. And I guess after doing this for, for several years and Bob for a few decades, uh, you know, we have the luxury of being able to invite people in here that understand that A, this is a business, B, this is a business that will take a few years to develop, and and understanding that the you know the average psychology of the mining investor is is somewhat very short term oriented. So we assume that into our going public transaction that at some point some of the earlier investors would want to monetize or crystallize some of their profits. So we we have worked uh, with with you know various high net worth and family office brokers, current shareholders who want to be supportive to the deal. So uh, we will look to help you know uh, facilitate anyone who wants to you know get in and get or or get out because in JR we had to we had to cut several shareholders back uh, due to the demand. You know, when someone's when someone like Bob Quartermain's name gets attached to a deal, there are a number of people who have made a lot of money with Bob. Bob is extremely meticulous. Uh, he does not take on anything, and he's very singularly focused. In you know his view, and I'm of the same opinion. There are very few mining entrepreneurs that can do multiple deals at the same time. So we anticipated that that our going public transaction would result in early investors that that wanted to sell and everyone needs capital for different reasons. But I think that that is a language that some mining companies in the earlier stages uh, either aren't fluent in or just don't understand. And I think that's that's a that's a, that can be an Achilles heel. Okay. So put another way, Jonathan, what you did is you basically got all of the early private investors in JR Resources together just before you went public with DTRC, the, the public company that's now trading already on the over-the-counter market. And you said, look, guys, in case anybody wants to sell, don't do something stupid and sell with market orders as soon as the market opens and, and crash the stock. Let's take care of that ahead of time. If anybody wants to sell, we got people on a list that want to buy more because they want to increase their allocation. You did all those private transactions ahead of time so that nobody would be coming into that first day of public trading trying to dump their shares, which has been the absolute poison pill to the launch of another a number of other companies. I really, really wanted to cover that topic specifically in this interview because I want every one of our accredited investors to hear it and join me in never again accepting 
a, a private placement deal unless the, uh, the company agrees to do something to try to manage this process. It was so easy to watch you guys do the right thing and you solved the problem. There was nobody rushing to sell their shares because people who wanted to sell their shares had the chance to do that a few days ahead of time before you went public. So congratulations on the way you handled that. I appreciate that. And, and I'm a, I won't tell you the name of the company, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a fairly large shareholder for, for our uh, family uh, in a, and a company that's just recently gone public, and this is a an extremely intelligent group, very sophisticated, understand their industry very well. So this, this is non uh, precious metals mining, and uh, they they open the stock up, and the stock is down thirty two percent from the last financing, which was done not more than two months ago. And this is this is you know sometimes these things take time to work out, but but it's it's also because this group is not overly capital market savvy. So it's, it's, um, I think it's very important that you have all those languages and all, all, all facets of the business understood. And look, there, there's going to be time times where you think that certain shareholders are going to play ball and they're going to mislead you. And that's, that's a, you know, a function of life. But I think, you know, relationships in this, in this business and life are, are very important. And I think Bob and I have cultivated some very strong ones over the last, you know, couple of decades. And I think that'll come into play here. Well, kudos for doing a terrific job and managing that private placement much more effectively than others that I've been involved with, both in precious metals and and elsewhere. Let's talk a little bit more about what's going on with Bob Quartermain, because when he was interviewed by Rick Rule and asked that question of who the up up and comers are, I think he was retired at that point. How did he get out unretired? Was that your doing? And what's what are you doing together? And what's Dakota Gold about? Well, actually, I met Bob. Uh, over 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, I was I was the CEO of, of a different gold exploration and development company, and I tried to hire him to be the chairman of my company. And Bob had left Silver Standard and had just acquired uh, Bruce Jack, actually from Silver Standard, and you know he formed Predium. So I, I've known Bob since 2010, and when when Bob left Predium. You know, he took some time off. We met and he said, you know, I'd, I'd love to do something, you know, with you with the right opportunity. And I said, look, I've got to finish what I'm doing with this company here. And uh, which was a company called Gold Standard Ventures. And we had formed this this private company called JR Resources. And um, this opportunity in South Dakota came to us. And, you know, he and I went down to see the project and, you um, you know, he said, what, what role would you foresee me playing? And I said, look, I'd like for you to be chairman of the company. And I said, not involved in the day-to-day, big picture, strategy, marketing, but let's reverse engineer this. You know, you're, you're now in the hall of fame. You know, you tell me if, if, if that's a role you're going to take, what do you want to do? You know, you're good at a lot of things, but there's certain things that you've done that you, that you haven't wanted to be involved with. So it's an honor for me to partner with you and for you to consider doing this. What will it take? What do you want to do? And more importantly, what do you not want to do? So I've tried to do that with Bob and we're very aligned with, with, you know, shareholders are very important to us. It's imperative that we're aligned. So strategy, marketing, and geology, you know, Bob is, Bob is a geologist. I mean, Bob took a piece of high grade core from Bruce Jack and in under seven years, made a brand new discovery, drilled it off, put economics around it, went through the permitting, raised $750 million, negotiated and dealt with seven different chiefs, learned several hundred words in seven different languages, got a permit, and built Bruce Jack into Canada's fourth largest gold mine. And it was just bought out by, by Newcrest for $3.8 billion, and he went public at three fifty. So Bob wants to do it a third time. And he's got actually a, a greater amount of money in Dakota Gold than he did Predium. And um, it's been an honor to work with him. Well, since Bob is the one who's really got the track record in this industry, let's talk about what that vision is that he's had that you guys are working on. I know one of the things that our friend Marin Katusa emphasizes is in 
times like these, as the world is getting more dangerous, you kind of want to stay out of what Marin calls the AK-47 countries. You guys at Dakota Gold are focusing on the Gold Old US of A as your uh, location for mining gold. Why in the US? Why this particular resource? And why is this the focus, given what you guys both see coming for the gold market? Yeah, so Marin and I are are 100% aligned on on being in countries where rule of law applies, uh, where you can get permits. And uh, we came across this opportunity in South Dakota. And a lot of people don't know, but the Homestake mine in Leeds, South Dakota, uh, was the largest mine of its kind in the history of the planet. And over 40 million ounces of gold came out of a single deposit from 1876 to 2001. And it was operated and owned by Homestake Mining Company. Barrick Gold, now the second largest company, uh, gold producing company in the world, bought Homestake in 2001. And Barrick didn't buy Homestake for South Dakota. They bought it for other assets in, in the Homestake portfolio. So we've done three transactions with Barrick over the last 18 months. And we now, we now are the largest landowners in the Northern Black Hills in South Dakota. And we combined our capital markets and business and strategic sense with the technical expertise of former homesick executives in an area that has received little to no exploration outside of the old mine. And one of the things that Homestake did is in the early 90s, Homestake realized that they had a finite resource and they and they made a discovery called the North Drift Discovery. It's actually on a project that we bought from Barrick. And this is the basis of our of our phase one exploration program. And we get asked all the time, well, what changed? I mean, why did Barrick agree to sell you these assets? Now, we don't own the minerals from the old mine. Those, own, those are owned by the state of South Dakota, but we have everything around it and we have the surface over it. Um, what changed was the merger between Barrick Gold and Rand Gold. And CEO Mark Bristow is, is, um, is really talented, very detail oriented. He's a geologist, you know, grew Rand Gold from a uh, single asset to multi asset in, into this you know, uh, tens of billions of dollar transaction. Bristol came in and said, if it's not tier one or tier two or strategic, get rid of it. And these assets that Barrick had in the district were in their closure group. So we dealt with uh, Mark Bristow and his team, and they've been extremely supportive. And some people could say, well, it's in their closure group. There could be some nasties. What's going on? Barrick has done two other successful transactions out of their closure group that have benefited everyone. And that's uh, Skeena Resources, which is now a billion and a half dollar company, and K92, which which um, bought an asset from Barrick out of their closure group in Papua New Guinea. And that's almost a $2 billion company. So, you know, when Barrick bought Homestake, the price of gold was $270 an ounce. Price of gold now is nineteen twenty five or or so. Uh, so there's, a, you know, it's a much different environment. And one of the other things that was so significant is, is getting access, exclusive access, to, to Barrick's data, not only inside the mine, but outside of the old mine. And that's been hugely invaluable in us growing our land package. When we first started this two years ago, almost three years ago, from 3,000 acres to over 42,000 acres. So Bob saw a lot of similarities, and he's, uh, he's extremely engaged. So the way that these companies come into existence starts with the private company that was JR Resources. Those companies get financed by private investors who have to be accredited investors. Uh, I was one of the JR Resources investors, as were a number of our listeners. And eventually, then you get to the point of an OTC listing, and then eventually you get to a major exchange listing. You guys are basically in the home stretch. When do you go public on a major exchange, and uh, is there a ticker symbol yet? And how can people find out more about that opportunity? Yeah. So, Eric, what's happening here is is I was in South Dakota last week uh, for the vote and the merger. So all four resolutions were passed. The merger has been approved. And uh, so we will delist from the -the over-the-counter exchange. We had a, so we used to trade under Dakota Territory Resource Corp. The symbol was DTRC. So that is no longer. On Tuesday of next week, so April 5th, uh, the company's new name is Dakota Gold Corp. And the new symbol is DC. So David Charlie, DC 
on the NYSE American. This will be a, uh, so this is a pure play South Dakota gold exploration and development company with a specific focus on revitalizing the Homestake Gold District just outside of Leeds, South Dakota. So we are going to be uh, a single listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol DC. First day of trading will be on Tuesday, April the 5th. And again, in the interest of full disclosure, I am a large investor already in this company and may buy more on the uh, IPO day, which is next Tuesday. Jonathan, we can't thank you enough. We're going to have to leave it there as we're out of time, but we look forward to getting you back on a future show. And that's a wrap for this week's show, folks. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find a transcript for today's interview, as well as a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelled with a K, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.